That includes Adelaide Stevenson, George Wallace, Eugene Debs, William Jennings Bryan. Well, tonight is our kickoff, and it's from outside Lexington, Kentucky, with Henry Clay, who served as Speaker of the House, and that begins at 8 p.m. tonight, and now the House is in session. From the Speaker. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., September 9, 2011. I hereby appoint the Honorable Candace L. Miller to act as Speaker Pro Temporary on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. And the prayer will be offered today by our Chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. We give you thanks as well as we begin the fall season of the People's House. Please give the members of this House hope and wisdom as they confront old problems and unresolved issues. Give them an understanding both of who they are called to be by you and what they are elected to do by the American people. Make them trustworthy as they seek what is best for our nation. Free them from defensiveness toward and suspicion of those with whom they do not share party loyalties or political persuasions. Bind them together in a shared commitment to you, a passionate patriotism, and a deep dedication to find creative solutions to the concerns that confront us and divide us in these times. May your blessing, O God, be with them and with us all this day and every day to come. And may all we do be done for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House her approval thereof. And pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The pledge will be led today by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to five requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. And the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, 10 years ago, I was headed to the courthouse as a judge in Houston, Texas. I was driving my Jeep, listening to country western music when I heard on the radio this alarm that New York was under attack. Later that day, as most Americans were watching television as I was later in the evening, I saw those attacks on New York and the Pentagon and how thousands of people, Americans, were running as hard as they could to get away from that terror in the skies. But there was another group of people, not very many, but they were there. And they were running as hard as they could to get to that terror from the skies. And who were they? They were our first responders, peace officers, Port Authority officers, firefighters, emergency medical technicians, and volunteers. And they rushed into those burning buildings and saved people. And while today it is just as important that we remember those thousands that died on 9-11, we should also remember those that got to live because America's first responders went into those buildings and saved them. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? And the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, Sunday is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, the day the world changed. 207 names are remembered in the Boston Public Garden 9-11 Memorial. Six were my constituents, Lynn Goodchild, Christopher Zarber, Jr., Linda George, Robin Kaplan, Diane Snyder, and Tara Kramer. Back then, Tony Blair challenged the world to use the unity created in the aftermath of those horrible attacks to create a community of good, to help the world's most vulnerable, those without schools, food, water, or work with dignity. We should reflect on how well we have responded to that challenge. We need to resolve to do better, to make our country better, and to do more to heal the wounds of the world. On the first Sunday after 9-11 at an ecumenical service in Worcester, Massachusetts, I said, our faith teaches us that love is stronger than hate. I still believe that. Now more than ever, 
I believe that is the legacy of 9-11, most deserving of our political will and attention. I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Congress for one minute. And the gentleman is recognized. The President's jobs message was clear and powerful. Government made America great and government can make it great again. This misguided view explains why two years after the recession supposedly ended, we are still left suffering with a second-rate economy that's being held up to ridicule by the world as our nation sinks deeper into debt and 22 million Americans can't find work. I was looking for real leadership and a mission the President's economic policies have failed and a call for a new start, a fresh new direction for this dismal economy. And other than the call for passing the free trade agreements, which the President himself continues to hold up, what America witnessed was a shopping cart of gimmicks to special interest voting blocks paid for by crushing tax increases on the very consumers and job creators we need to get out of this dismal economy. If you like the leadership of the last two years on the economy, you're going to love this President's job agenda. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? You know, consent to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, having spent the last several weeks in Rhode Island with families, small business owners, manufacturers, and builders, people in my district are hurting, facing real struggles every single day. And the jobs crisis is causing real anxiety and real havoc in their daily lives. Last night, the President laid out a serious plan to get Rhode Islanders and Americans back to work. The President put forth a jobs plan that reflects many of the priorities I've been working on and have heard during my community suppers, small business tours, and visits with manufacturers. Strategies to rebuild American manufacturing and to make it in America again. Creating jobs by enacting small business tax cuts. Supporting workers by expanding middle class tax cuts and rebuilding our nation's roads, bridges, and schools. And providing greater support and job opportunities for returning veterans, the long-term unemployed, and our young people. The time for taking action to create jobs is now. Americans have endured the crushing consequences of this economic recession for far too long, and there is no time to waste. I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. For what purpose is the gentleman from Texas to rise? Granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since December, fires have been ravaging drought-stricken Texas, claiming two lives, more than 1,500 homes, and 3.5 million acres of land. My deepest prayers and sympathy go out to the victims of these wildfires, and my thanks and appreciation go out to those brave firefighters battling these devastating flames. FEMA and the White House must help Texas during this time of natural disaster and provide the tools needed to fight these devastating fires. Disasters like these fires are why FEMA was created. Just this week, fires have crept into eight more counties, forcing thousands to evacuate and wait in fear, praying their homes and life savings don't go up in smoke. I'll do more than pray. The House of Representatives will find the necessary tools to combat this disaster, and I'll push government at all levels to provide the necessary resources for firefighters. If you live in one of these danger zones, like folks in the Bastrop and surrounding counties, Please listen to federal, state, and local officials' warning and advice, and I will continue to pray for rain and the safety of those involved in, harm in this disaster and those in harm's way. Thank you very much. I yield back. For what purpose was the gentleman from Minnesota rise? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today with a simple message. Let's stay here and work for America. Last night, the President stood right there and challenged us to do what's right for America. We should do that, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to knock off early at noon today. The president wasn't allowed to speak on Wednesday because we had important business. We had one procedural vote to allow the Capitol grounds to be used for an event. That is unacceptable. We should stay here and work and get her done. Last night I brought Lee Hiller to this speech. Lee's a heavy crane operator with the operating engineers. He said one thing to me. I've got guys who want to work. They're ready to work. 
put us to work. Today, school teachers are waking up all across America, getting up early, staying late to educate our children. Nurses are going to work 12-hour shifts curing the sick. And veterans overseas will work long hours protecting this nation. The least we can do is stay here and do our job. Mr. Speaker, I encourage Americans all across this country, call their member of Congress, tell them to get her done and work the way they're paid to do. Let's stay here and do that. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last night the President stood here, and he stood here to speak to us. He came to talk about his proposed American Jobs Act, and I'm sure each and every one of us heard what we wanted to, didn't hear what we wanted to, and we took away different things after that speech. But what we all should have heard is that we were hired. I think those words were great. We were hired to do a job, and we must do that job. People are not going to wait 14 months for us to get our act together, especially those who are unemployed. We should also have heard the cry for the future of our nation. The President said we must invest in our future. We must become the number one nation again. We cannot let China outbuild us, and neither can we have China and Europe take over manufacturing. Those are things that we the United States has been known for. We must do that. We must invest in ourselves again. We must invest in becoming the number one nation in the world. And we can do that. We are all committed to make it in America. Mr. Speaker, if we cannot put the pride of our nation before all of us, we will never come together. Let us invest in America. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York rise? The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, 10 years ago, the horror of 9-11 struck this great nation. But in its aftermath, I have never seen this nation or this Congress so united and so determined to make sure that we protect our citizens and that it does not happen again. We came together with such a strong purpose, and we need to come together again with a strong purpose behind the President's jobs proposal. Fourteen million Americans are out of work. He has a plan. Let's unify, let's work together, and let's put Americans back to work building our crumbling in infrastructure, repairing our schools, investing in innovation, education, and working together. We did it after 9-11, after that great crisis. We can do it again. The President has a plan. Let's get behind that plan. If the Republicans have a plan, then put it forward. Let's look at it. Let's work together and put Americans back to work. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Mr. Speaker, I have a bill at the desk. What's the number of your bill? 18. Where is it? Pursuant to the radar call. 18. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days 
in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 1892. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 392 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole the House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 1892. The Chair appoints the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 1892, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to authorize appropriations for the fiscal year 2012 for intelligence and intelligence-related activities of the United States government, the Community Management Account, and the Central Intelligence Agency Retirement and Disability System, and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Rupertsberger, will each control 30 minutes, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would yield myself as much time as I might consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I first wish to announce that subsequent to ordering the bill reported, the committee has modified the classified schedule of authorizations to the bill with respect to the level of funding of certain programs with bipartisan agreement between myself and my ranking member, Mr. Ruppersberger. The classified annex containing the schedule of authorizations is available for review by all members of the House, subject to the rules of the House and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence under the procedures described in my announcement to the House on Wednesday. The modified schedule of author authorizations is and has been available for review to members for a period of, re of time required by the rules of the House. Madam Chair, I, uh, I think this is an important day for the community, certainly rolling into the weekend of the 10th anniversary of that tragic event on 9-11. Uh, it is important, it is crucial uh, that we continue to monitor, to improve, to provide support for our intelligence services who so bravely around the world and here at home serve to protect the United States of America. The bill before us today is a vital tool for our oversight of the intelligence community's classified activities and is critical to ensuring our intelligence agencies have the resources and authorities they need to do their important work. Passing an annual intelligence bill is vital to keeping the laws governing our intelligence operations up to date. The FY12 bill, fiscal year 12 bill, sustains today's intelligence operations and provides for future capabilities while achieving significant savings. Excuse me. <clears throat> the U.S. intelligence community plays a critical role in the war on terrorism and securing the country from many other threats that we face. This bill funds all U.S. intelligence agencies spanning 17 separate agencies, totaling roughly $80 billion. The bill's comprehensive classified annex provides detailed guidance on intelligence spending, including adjustments to costly programs. It provides oversight and authorization for critical intelligence activities, including, but not limited, to the global counterterrorism operations, such as the one that took out Osama bin Laden, tactical intelligence support to combat units in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and other places, cyber defense by the National Security Agency, detecting and countering the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the R&D, the research and development of new technology to maintain our intelligence agency's te technological edge, including work on code breaking and spy satellites. Uh, and the bill also reflects our tough economic times as well, Madam Chair. Uh, after passage of the Budget Control Act, the committee revamped the bill. It reported out of committee in May uh, to double its budget savings. The bill is significantly below the President's uh, fiscal year 12 budget request and further still below the FY11 authorized and appropriated levels. And we accomplished this without impacting the mission. The, the savings were achieved uh, uh, through a whole series of, of joint work and effort uh, by many to merge services and find savings that would bring efficiencies, as I said again, Madam Chair, without impacting uh, their, our mission, uh, the mission of the intelligence services. The bill curbs unnecessary personnel growth. The cost of additional personnel would squeeze funding for high-tech investments, which is our competitive advantage in intelligence. While the bill denies most of the administration's requested personnel increases, it adds some key positions in high-priority areas, such as cyber defense. 
The bill also promotes major operating efficiencies in a number of areas, including data processing, IT, and office leases, finding over $100 million in savings. This bill also uh, uh, makes only best value investments uh, and shaves $1 billion from a handful of very large ticket hardware items uh, and programs uh, that the uh, intelligence community is involved in. The bill protects investments in cutting-edge R&D and redirects $500 million of savings to invest in some game-changing technologies. The bottom line is this bipartisan bill preserves and advances national security, and it is also fiscally responsible. Secrecy is a necessary part of our country's intelligence work, so the intelligence committees must conduct strong and effective oversight on behalf of the American people. That oversight is impossible, however, without an annual intelligence authorization bill. And, Madam Chair, that's why we stand before you today with a bill that I think this body can be proud of, America can be proud of, and our intelligence community can take to the bank that we're investing in their mission success. And I would uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Maryland. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise today in favor of the Intelligence Authorization Act for FY 2012. Uh, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. And the gentleman is recognized. When Chairman Rogers and I took over leadership of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, we made a commitment to getting back into the practice of passing intelligence budgets. We made a commitment to the men and women of the intelligence community to do what is right, to give our intelligence professionals the resources capabilities, and authorities they need to keep us safe. We on the Intelligence Committee have a responsibility to provide effective oversight, to help build up the community, not to tear it down, to hold the community accountable for performance while upholding the Constitution and protecting civil liberties. This is even more important today as we approach the 10th anniversary of 9-11, where close to 3,000 innocent Americans lost their lives. The bill makes smart choices by trimming where possible, eliminating duplicative efforts, and ensuring we do not affect the current critical capabilities that protect our nation now and in the future. The bill aligns our resources with our current threats in a fiscally responsible manner. After the debt debate this last summer, our committee trimmed our budget even further to keep its costs in check. The bill curbs personal growth when appropriate, never affecting the core commission the core mission. It invests in new positions for select high priority needs such as FBI surveillance officers to keep watch on terrorists, NSA cyber professionals to protect computers from malicious intrusions, and Treasury financial analysts to unravel terrorist plots. We found major savings in operating costs, pushed down the price of programs through intense oversight, required acquisitions to come in on budget and on schedule and invested in research and technology to keep our competitive edge. We fully funded the President's major satellite program, as well as commercial imagery, to ensure our intelligence professionals, the warfighter, and our allies have the information they need on the front lines around the world. Right now, this bill includes two controversial provisions relating to the Guantanamo Bay detainees and another making the Director of National Security Agency a Senate-confirmed position. These provisions garnered a veto threat from the White House. Chairman Rogers and I worked together to come up with a solution. Today's manager's amendment withdraws the Gitmo and the NSA director provisions. I encourage all members to vote in favor of the manager's amendment. If these provisions can be successfully eliminated, I will support this bill and look forward to seeing it become law. This bill will make great investments in space, cyber, and the warfighter. Republicans and Democrats will work together with our Senate counterparts to make this a good bipartisan bill. Intelligence is clearly the best defense against terrorism. This is even more important as we approach the 10-year anniversary of September 11th attacks. If this bill is signed into law, it will be the third time in three years that the Intelligence Committee passed an Intel Authorization Act. For the five years before that, we did not have an intelligence bill. With this bill, we are giving the intelligence community guidance and critical direction. We are doing our job. With the passage of the manager's amendment, I believe this is a good bipartisan bill that makes important decisions to protect our families and communities. I urge my colleagues to support it and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Maryland reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Michigan. 
waiting for a speaker, Madam Chair, I'd like to reserve uh, my time, if I may. I think. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Yes, yes uh, Madam Speaker, I uh, yield four minutes to the gentleman from California, uh, the Vice Chair uh, of the Democratic Committee. The gentleman from California is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Ruperger. Um, Madam Chair, I rise in support of H.R. 1892, the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, as amended by the manager's amendment. As a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Terrorism, Human Intelligence, Analysis, and Counterintelligence, I'm pleased that we're able to work together to bring a bipartisan intelligence authorization bill to the floor today. H.R. 1892 will support critical U.S. intelligence capabilities by strengthening funding for our intelligence collection programs, enhancing counterintelligence efforts, and improving upon critical training operations vital to the future of the intelligence community. This legislation also includes two provisions that I authored. The first provision requires that the Director of National Intelligence to compile a threat assessment of foreign drug traffickers that are increasingly turning public lands in the United States uh, to further their operation. Last year alone, over three million marijuana plants were eradicated on 62 of our national forests. The effect of these illegal drug grows has been profound leading to unacceptable levels of violence and the devastation of our environment and our natural resources. Our public lands have been taken away from us. This is wrong and it must be stopped. This threat assessment will examine the ability of law enforcement and the intelligence community to gather, process, and share critical intelligence information regarding the presence of foreign drug traffickers on our, public, our federal public lands. This coordination between the intelligence community and local law enforcement is extremely important. The second provision that I authored requires the director of the Central Intelligence Agency to provide Congress with a full report on the events surrounding the May uh, 2011 Osama bin Laden raid. This record, once complete, will provide an official account of a critical point in our country's history. We're all proud of the intelligence community's extraordinary effort in carrying out the bin Laden operation. I believe it is necessary that we never forget what actually happened in the raid and to be able to recognize the amazing contribution of the intelligence community and this important success. The historical significance of this mission cannot be understated. That's why we must make a determined effort to document and preserve all that went into this operation so that in the future the history books will be accurate and complete. I'd like to just take a moment to thank my friend and a former committee colleague of ours, Representative Eshoo, for her work on this important part of the bill. Madam Speaker, our intelligence community must be prepared for any and all threats. While Osama bin Laden may no longer pose a direct threat to our country's safety and security, the remaining elements of Al-Qaeda and other emerging terrorist organizations are more determined than ever. It is critical for Congress to pass an intelligence authorization that furthers our national security, which I believe this bill with the manager's amendment will do. This legislation is necessary, will enhance the capabilities of the intelligence community, specifically our counterterrorism efforts, and will make our nation stronger. I urge my colleagues to support the amended bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Michigan continues to reserve. I continue to reserve, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Maryland. Yes, I, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Consentich. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. I thank uh, my friend from Maryland. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of the dedicated public servants of our intelligence community. Their work to ensure national security is to be commended. However, I must oppose the Intelligence Authorization Act of 2012. Ten years after 9-11, the United States continues to use its intelligence 
and defense apparatus in ways that undermine the rule of law at home and abroad. There are plenty of examples in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. A recent PBS frontline feature featuring uh, a top CIA official who was at the agency for over 34 years was quoted as saying, quote, the Obama administration changed virtually nothing with respect to existing CIA programs and operations, unquote. Last month, the Associated Press reported that the New York Police Department was using domestic surveillance methods in conjunction with the Central Intelligence Agency to spy on local communities in a way that significantly undermined civil liberties. The United States continues to use drones for targeted assassination under the color of international law. Earlier this year, we rubber stamped three provisions of the Patriot Act that allowed the government to conduct surveillance and demand records from innocent Americans with impunity, even for activities associated with First and Fourth Amendment rights. Yesterday, it was reported in the New York Times and other publications that Russian heat-seeking missiles, quote, could be used to shoot down civilian airline that could be used to shoot down civilian airliners have gone missing from warehouses in Libya. Now think about this. Who has control over Libya right now? The, the CIA, everyone knows this, the CIA was involved in the overthrow of, this, of the uh, government of Gaddafi. Now whether you agree with the overthrow or not, it's not the point here. Didn't we know about these weapons warehouses ahead of time? There was one news report that said there might be as many as 20,000 surface-to-air missiles that could be in jeopardy of being lost, missing, gone to the black market, in who knows whose hands. And it's the rebels that are running there now, and I'm also concerned about that because of the stories about al-Qaeda's connection uh, to the rebels from the beginning of the insurrection. Despite the drones, intelligence personnel we have on the ground, and nearly, three, and nearly a billion dollars we've already spent in the war in Libya, no one seems to know who took the missiles or who has them. How's this, how is this allowed to happen? And who needs to be held accountable? And this is a debate we should be having exactly today over this uh, legislation. What happened to the missiles? Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I have a lot of respect for Mr. Kucinich. I, I think on this, uh, unfortunately, his facts are just not correct. And, you know, it's, it's interesting in the business of intelligence because so much of it is classified, uh, that there, the rhetoric is easy to throw around and the condemnation is easy to, to heap on the very brave men and women who are following the law that we give them overseas. And I think that's one of the reasons that this administration came to power and said all of these kinds of things and all the rhetoric around a political campaign just wasn't true. They found that they were following the law. They were comporting with the missions and guidelines and objectives in accordance with the law of the United States. So they are, in fact, following the law. There is, was no, absolutely no role for the CIA to overthrow the Gaddafi regime. That is just faults. So I think we need to be careful about making these assertions that are pretty damning, if you will, that are completely inaccurate. We may believe that happened. I can tell you as an intelligence, uh, on the Intelligence Committee and my friend Dutch Ruppersberger, we watch this closely. And one of the reasons I hope you'll change your mind on the bill, Madam Chair, is that we need the ability to have oversight of these 17 agencies. This bill allows us to do it. By having no bill, for six years no authorization bill uh, of any meaning was passed in this House. That's when problems start. So this gets us back to regular order. It gets us back into the business of conducting proper oversight and setting the guidelines in the classified annex, which I would urge the, urge the gentleman to come down and review uh, in the uh, uh, House Intelligence Committee, uh, which every member has the privilege uh, and I argue responsibility to do that, if that's what they desire to do, w lays out very clear guidelines on spending and objectives and policies. So I, I would argue that the gentleman's uh, position is misstated. Uh, I understand his frustration, 
Uh, but again, this gets us back to regular order, and I praise the administration for continuing the programs that we know that were put in place under the last administration that are keeping Americans safer today. And with that, Madam uh, Chair, I would reserve uh, the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Maryland. Uh, I'll, re I'll, I'll uh, yield 30 seconds to Mr. Kucinich. Uh, gentleman from Ohio for 30 seconds. I, I honor the chairman's service, and, and I know of your dedication to our country. Uh, what I'm pointing out is that I think it's timely to have the discussion about the role that the CIA had in uh, Libya, which was really no secret, and the fact that these missiles that really we should know ahead of time that the, where they were, that that should have been the first place we went to guard. All of a sudden we have surface air missiles that can't be accounted for. I think the CIA has to take responsibility for that. I want to thank the gentleman, though, for the way in which he's conducted uh, the points that he's made. Gentleman from Michigan. And I, I, again, I thank the gentleman for his, his comments. I, I, too, have concerns about weapon systems in Libya. But one of the problems was you can't be against the intelligence services being places to collect information and then wonder why they're not in a place to get the information that we might need. And that's part of the problem here. There was no uh, CIA involvement in the regime change. None. That, that did not happen. I don't know where that got started. That is inaccurate information. Uh, and I would be careful about us throwing out that the agency was involved in some regime change. They were not. We have pressed the agency and the administration to be more aggressive on accounting for uh, and rendering safe weapon systems that are all scattered around Libya. We saw this in Iraq. When the regime uses these weapon caches not to protect the citizens of its own state, but to protect its regime, it becomes much more difficult to get a handle on it. And so we ought to be celebrating the, the agency's work in trying to determine where these systems are and how we render them safe and account for them. And one way we can do that is passing this bill that gives them the resources to do exactly that. I, I would hope the gentleman would, would uh, have a change of heart. Yes, sir, I would. Yeah. I just would want to confirm, uh, and Mr. Kucinich, I do respect uh, what your comments and your point of view, but our role in the Intelligence Committee is oversight. And when we can pass bills, we work and oversee all these agencies. And if we find out where there are allegations of concern, let me know, and we will try to do what we can do to get information. But I know of no situation that we have not been told in the last couple of years when Mr. Rogers and I have been working together. I think it's important for the United States of America to remember this. In my opinion, the best defense against terrorism is intelligence, but it's got to be done the right way and protect civil liberties. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the, the, the gentleman's position from sure. Ohio as well. I respect his position and hope that we can work out those differences as we move forward. I would uh, continue to reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Maryland. Yes, uh, I yield two minutes uh, to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, and I thank the gentlelady the from New York is recognized for two minutes. I thank the ranking member for his uh, leadership uh, in so many ways before this Congress, and uh, Chairman Rogers for his lifetime commitment uh, to protecting Americans, even as a former FBI agent. I, I want to underscore what the ranking member said. The best defense against terrorism is intelligence. And we need to support this bill in every single way. We were reminded of the need of intelligence yesterday when Mayor Bloomberg announced there was a credible threat against New York and Washington. And where did this information come from? It came from the intelligence community. After 9-11, the 9-11 Commission report said the biggest failure in preventing a future and preventing 9-11 was a failure in our intelligence system. And this Congress came together, and I was proud to have worked with and helped author a bill that was the first major reorganization and, and the most fundamental since 1948, where it brought all 17 agencies together under a Homeland Security and one director to gather information to make us safer. This bill very critically supports uh, the task force, the joint terrorism task forces that are sharing information and protecting our citizens. And this bill approaches and focuses on cyber attacks, which is one of the most serious attacks that we have in our country now on the Pentagon. 
and on financial institutions. Foreign countries are hacking into our information systems. And so this uh, bill uh, addresses that and focuses resources and oversight in that area. I, I congratulate uh, this bipartisan effort. I consider it one of the most important bills that we have an opportunity to vote on, and I support it completely. I yield back. Gentleman from Michigan. Madam Chair, continue to reserve the balance. Of my Continues time. to reserve. Gentleman from Maryland. Uh, I, I, uh, Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to, to my good friend, uh, Jim Langman from Rhode Island. Gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for three minutes. And the gentleman is recognized. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. Let me just say how proud I am to support the FY 2012 Intelligence Authorization Act. And I appreciate the leadership of both Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Ruppersberger in crafting this bill. This has truly been a bipartisan effort of which I have been proud to be a part. I am pleased that uh, uh, this bill includes funding uh, to accelerate implementation of an insider threat detection program. And that's both on the, uh, the cyber front uh, but also uh, in cases like the Hassan case uh, that were tragically in the news uh, and that occurred not long ago that cost many lives. Uh, this bill basically requires best practices implemented within the Army uh, to be reviewed for inclusion across the intelligence community. That's referring to their insider threat detection program. In addition, the bill supports uh, critical resources needed for cybersecurity, the broader cybersecurity threat, a threat which demands the attention of our national security specialists and the entire country. As the successful operation against Osama bin Laden showed us earlier this year, the intelligence community has made significant strides toward working together to counter the most complex threats facing our nation. This productive cooperation and integration embodies the intent of congressional intelligence reforms made after the tragic events of 9-11, and I'm encouraged to see this progress in, this, in the area of information sharing. Yet while the Sharing of classified information is imperative to keep our country safe. Unrestrained and unregulated access can put our country at great risk. As we've seen from both the damage of WikiLeaks and historical espionage cases, the threat from a malicious insider with the keys to the kingdom is very real. We are far beyond uh, the risk of paper documents being copied and carried out. Today the question is how much information can a potential leaker or a spy fit onto a USB uh, drive or a CD? Although technological advances have strengthened the efforts of our intelligence community, they have also increased the risks. Now, with this, this serious concern in mind, I'm proud that this bill requires the DNI uh, to review improvements made by the Army's insider threat regulations and consider implementation of these practices across the entire intelligence community. And in, in addition, the bill accelerates other technical initiatives within the insider threat program. I believe it's imperative that we ensure that our security officers and network administrators have the capabilities in place to protect our most sensitive information. Now, in view of the enormous resources spent on security clearances, protecting classified information and securing networks across the globe, it also makes fiscal sense to protect our investment by taking advantage of the auditing software already available today. Now, access to classified information bears with it significant responsibilities one that I know that I and my colleagues on the committee take very seriously. The other serious threats which this bill addresses are the risk posed, of course, by, uh, to our, our broader cyber networks. Now, I'm proud that it strengthens resources and furthers the administration's efforts to address the threats of our critical infrastructure. I know that this is something also that is shared by my colleague, Congressman Ruckersberger. While I applaud the administration's work, I think we need to go further Gentlemen, recognized. While I applaud the administration's work, I think that we need to go further to raise awareness and work with both public and private sector partners to meet this threat. We cannot afford to continue operating with the massive digital vulnerabilities to, uh, to not just our sensitive information, but also uh, important intellectual property that makes, us, that makes up the foundation of our uh, innovative economy. Addressing these threats must become a national priority, and we must work quickly to grow our current and future cyber workforce to fill the rising demand for cybersecurity information and assurance. This bill helps, ensure, it helps secure our sensitive information and vital networks to threats 
for malicious actors beyond our borders and on the inside because of these important provisions, along with the other merits cited in my colleague, by my colleagues today, I urge members to support this bill. I thank again Chairman Rogers and uh, Ranking Member Ruppersberger for the outstanding uh, bipartisan cooperation uh, that we've seen in, in their leadership and also the other members of the committee. Uh, it's a committee that I'm proud to serve on and I thank them and the committee for their work and I urge members to support this bill and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll reserve to close. Continues to reserve. The gentleman from Maryland. I'll reserve to close also. Gentleman from... I yield back. You, you going to cl close? I, I, I would reserve to close. If, if uh, I think you have, do you have another speaker? No, I no, no, no which chair is I here today, so I reserve. Gentleman from Michigan. Does the gentleman from Maryland yield back? I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I just want to clarify: Does the gentleman yield back all his time, or does he reserve time no, no, to I, close? I reserve the balance of my time just to close. Just yeah, close, as as, yes. as am I. I think I have the right no, to close. No more speakers. Gentleman from Maryland to close. Yes. Uh, Madam Chairman, I yield myself uh, as much time as I may consume. And the gentleman's recognized. It took a long time for us to get here today. Days of important hearings, analyzing the intelligence community, hours of critical meetings, uh, making important decisions of what to include and not to include in the bill, and lots of time pulling it together. Republicans and Democrats came together to make important choices to do what is right for the intelligence community and for our country. I commend everyone who participated in this effort, especially the bipartisan leadership of Chairman Rogers and other members of the Intelligence Committee. I would like to thank both Democrat and Republican staff for the countless hours they sent, spent helping us make this happen. With the passage of the manager's amendment, I fully support this bill and urge my colleagues to do the same. The stakes are too high not to. Thank you, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman yield back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Maryland yes. yields back his time. Yield back. The gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Ruppersberger, who is uh, not only a colleague but a friend in working so diligently over the course of the summer uh, and really at the beginning of this year uh, to reestablish the Intelligence Committee uh, as a force for oversight over the 17 agencies. Uh, it is a tremendous amount of money and it is a tremendous amount of responsibility because most of what we do happens behind closed doors uh, and is classified. And I think working together, we have come to one of the best products, certainly I've seen since on the committee, of the most thorough review from line by line by line of both the national intelligence program spending as well as the military intelligence program spending. And we've had very good cooperation because we've cooperated together from the agencies themselves. Uh, and there really was, I think, a unity of effort here that I think Americans can and should be proud of. Uh, in an effort to make sure that our men and women who are risking their lives today uh, to protect the United States of America have the resources they need and the commitment on behalf of this Congress and the American people uh, to be successful uh, in their particular mission. Uh, I want to thank the staffs on both committees. For the first time, we had joint briefings with both Republican and Democrat staff on the very difficult budget issues uh, that worked sometimes through the, intel the process of the intelligence authorization bill. Uh, they briefed at the same table at the same time, which sounds a little uh, something that should happen more often, but it doesn't, did not, and we have reestablished that. We've reestablished the quarterly reviews on all of the programs so that we have regular and consistent oversight on what happens in the intelligence community. And that all wouldn't really have happened without the leadership of Mr. Ruppersberger and his team uh, and my team as well. And there are too many to name who spent countless hours uh, on this particular bill, the leadership team here and all the folks on the intelligence staff. Uh, honorable mention to Brian Smith, our budget director, uh, who uh, gave a lot of his heart and soul to go through every line and find every penny for us. Uh, and I know uh, on uh, Mr. Ruppersberger's staff, they have, they have uh, sat beside him the entire time to make that happen. So without uh, further ado, Madam Chair, we'll get to the amendments. But again, I, uh, I do think this is a product that reflects the best uh, of what Congress can do when we work together and the best of the most uh, amazing people in our intelligence community and what they have to offer in the protection of the United States of America. And with that, I would yield back my time. Gentleman from Michigan yields back the balance of his time. And all time for general debate has expired.
Pursuant to the rule, the bill should be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. In lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of the Rules Committee print dated August 31, 2011. That amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered read. No amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute made in order as original text shall be in order, except those printed in Part B of House Report 112, or 112 through 200 and amendments on block described in Section 2F of House Resolution 392. Each amendment printed in Part B of the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and the opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. It shall be in order at any time for the chair of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or his designee to offer amendments on block consisting of amendments printed in Part B not earlier disposed of. Amendments on block shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 10 minutes equally divided, and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The original proponent of an amendment included in such amendments on block may insert a statement in the congressional record immediately before disposition of the amendments on block, and it is now in order to consider amendment number one printed in part B of House Report 112 through 200. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to modify the manager's amendment to include a clarification at the request of the ranking member. The modification is at the desk. The will designate the amendment. Amendment number one printed in part B of House Report number 112-200 offered by Mr. Rogers of Michigan. And clerk will report the modification. Modification to amendment number one offered by Mr. Rogers of Michigan. After the amendment to line 15 of page 24 of the bill, insert the following. Strike section 401, page 26, line 12, through page 29, line 6. Clerk will suspend. Does the gentleman from Michigan seek re resignation? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> recognition. Uh, no, no on the resignation, <laughs> Madam Chair, but thank you for the offer. I appreciate it. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that the modification be considered as read. Is there objection? <laughs> No objection. Hearing none, the clerk will continue. Modification without objection is considered. Madam Chair. And without objection, the modification is agreed to. And pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. In recognition. Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, from Michigan. The, uh, this is the manager's amendment to the bill. This is the last few details that uh, we were able to work out in a bipartisan way uh, to bring the bill to the floor. The manager's amendment is primarily intended to remove three provisions that have been subject of a veto threat by the administration. In addition, it makes a number of largely technical clarifications and adds a provision on authority to fill vacancies that was inadvertently omitted from the, the uh, Rules Committee print of the bill. Uh, Madam Chair, as I explained during the general debate, moving this bill forward is critical to ensure comprehensive legislative oversight of our intelligence activities and, just as importantly, intelligence budgeting and spending. While I regret that our efforts to reach accommodation on these provisions, which were originally included in the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee's bill, it is important to, that we remove these contentious provisions now so that the detailed spending and oversight recommendations in the classified annex can go forward. The first contentious provision would have required uh, Senate confirmation of the National Security Administration's director. Uh, the other two contentious provisions subject to veto would have required the production of certain State Department cables related to de detainee negotiations. While I support the production of these materials, the committees seeking them have other tools at their disposal to obtain them, and the bill should not be held up over that document dispute. In addition, the manager's amendment includes a clarification to clarify Section 310 on mitigating risks in the supply chain to ensure that those authorities cannot be delegated below the level of a service acquisition executive. The change is important to ensure the appropriate level of management is involved in such important decisions. This change reflects the committee's understanding that these acquisition authorities will not be used lightly 
and that all decisions under this provision will be carried out by responsible senior officials within the intelligence community and coordinated and overseen by the Director of National Intelligence. Finally, the manager's amendment contains a modification request, uh, requested by the ranking member to a provision concerning narcotics trafficking on public lands. The modification is needed to clarify the intended, the intended scope of the pr provision to ensure it is not read too broadly. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I ask members to support the manager's amendment and would reserve the balance of my time. The question is on the amendment as modified. The gentleman from Michigan, does any member seek recognition? Uh, the gentleman Madam, from Madam Maryland. Speaker, yes, I strongly support the manager's amendment. Uh, the manager's amendment uh, deals with the issues that the uh, chairman talked about. Also, it was our negotiation to resolve certain issues, and that has been done. So I fully support it, and uh, I reserve. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman yields back. I would Any yield other back member wish to be heard? If not, the question is on the amendment as modified, offered by the gentleman from Michigan. And those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The amendment as modified is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in Part B of House Report number 112-200, offered by Mr. Wolf of Virginia. Uh, I have a modification uh, at the desk and ask unanimous consent for its consideration. The clerk will report the modification to amendment number two, printed in Part B of House Report 112-200. Modification to Amendment Number Two, offered by Mr. Wolf of Virginia. Strike the entire text of the amendment and insert the following. At the end of Title Three, add the following: Section 312, Counterterrorism Competitive I Analysis you Commission. To dispense with the reading. Without objection, the reading of the amendment, as modified, is suspended. Dispense with. Without objection, the amendment is modified. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Wolf, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend. Without objection. S secondly, I want to personally thank uh, Mr. Rogers and his staff for helping with regard to this amendment with regard to radicalization. And I also want to thank Mr. Ruppersberger also, as somebody who served here for a number of years, I want to say I don't think there have been two finer uh, chairman and uh, ranking member of the Intelligence Committee since I've been here. And uh, it, it's, I think it's very impressive to, to see that. I just want uh, everyone up here, particularly in the country, to, to know that. Very briefly, this amendment deals with radicalization. I won't go into the whole statement, but I would just read several examples of radicalization that have taken place in Northern Virginia. In October 2010, Farouk Ahmad from Ashburn, my congressional district, Vienna, was arrested for allegedly plotting attacks on a Washington metro system and targeting metro stations to find optimal times to kill as many innocent people as possible. In July 2010, Zachary Chesser, a graduate of nearby Oakton High School, very close to where I live, was arrested in New York en route to join an Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Late last year, Chester pled guilty to charges of providing material support to terrorists communicating threats and soliciting crimes of violence and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. In November 2009, five American teenagers from Fairfax County, Virginia, were arrested in Pakistan attempting to join militant Islamist organizations. They've been sentenced to 10 years in Pakistan prison. In November 2009, Virginia native Army Major Nita Hassan attacked at Fort Hood in Texas and was charged with shooting deaths of 13 servicemen and women and civilians. Hassan was a graduate of Virginia Tech and grew up in Arlington County in Roanoke, Virginia. In 2004, Abdul Rahman Alamudi from Falls Church, Virginia, was convicted on three charges of terrorist financing a conspiracy and conspiring to assassinate Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah and was sentenced to 23 years in jail and is in jail now. In 2003, Ahmad Omar Abu Ali, Northern Virginia resident and the Islamic Saudi Academy's 1999 valedictorian, was arrested in Saudi Arabia and was later convicted in federal district court in Alexander for conspiracy to commit terrorism, including a plot to assassinate President Bush. He was sentenced to life in prison, and probably the number one terrorist threat today is Al-Aqwe, 
who is an American citizen, went to college on American taxpayers' money, was with a mosque in Northern Virginia and Falls Church, was used to be in my old congressional dis district. So this issue of radicalization is very important. And with that, again, I want to thank the chairman and his staff, and Mr. Ruppersberger and his staff. And with regard to that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman from Maryland. Uh, I just uh, want to thank my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Wolf. Um, the gentleman claim time in I opposition? Claim, yes. No, I want to thank my friend in, in all national security issues. We served together on the uh, Commerce and Justice Subcommittee and Appropriations, and we worked together on gangs. So I appreciate your, your focus on this area to protect our citizens, citizens of our countries and our district. Uh, I, res I reserve the balance and yield back. The gentleman yields back. Any other member wish to be heard? If not, the question is on the amendment as modified, offered by the gentleman from Virginia. And those in favor will signify by saying aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment as modified is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number three, printed in part B of House Report 112-200. The chair understands that amendment number four will not be offered. That's correct. It is now in order to consider amendment number five, printed in part B of House Report 112-200. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Uh, yes, I have an amendment 